Um, but it is uh, my privilege to now introduce Shalane McRae. Uh, she was uh, noted earlier as the first lady of New York City. I think that totally understates her role there. Uh, it's, be it's better to say the mayor of New York is married to her. So uh, she is a writer, a poet, an outspoken advocate for women, for mental health, and for justice. And I want to note she's also a mom uh, of a, a very courageous daughter who, in the midst of uh, the mayoral campaign back in, in 2013, used the platform she had to describe her own struggles with mental health, with addiction, uh, and made an enormous impact. And I had a chance to speak to Kiara and, uh, at that time and uh, was just so impressed uh, by her. Uh, Shirlane is reimagining mental health services in, a city, in the city, making systemic change. She's launched Thrive New York's Thrive NYC, an umbrella of 54 mental health initiatives with a four-year budget of more than $850 million, setting out, among other things, to train 250,000 New Yorkers in mental health first aid over five years and launching a city-sponsored 24-hour hotline for mental health and substance abuse services. She has made changing the culture, the conversation, and the system around mental health and addiction a priority in the city of New York and has elevated those issues to the top of the political uh, agenda. Shirlane, please come up and uh, receive an award. You know, Tom Dart talked about there need no be any more commissions. Obviously, we went to PC, and I'd get a bat failing grade for whatever I just said. Uh, go Friars. But um, we don't need to talk to the experts anymore about what needs to be done. We know social determinants. We know wraparound services. We know early intervention. And people like David Satcher, who's been doing this a lot longer than all of us, has given us the Surgeon General report that did all that. So the great thing about what the First Lady has done is she's disseminated that plan through the city of New York and shown elected officials what to do. Chris. My cousin Chris is here. Maybe he'll take a page from Thrive New York just as when he's elected governor. By the way, you got to, you got to, <clears throat> I know it's a very, uh, it's a very competitive primary, but what do you expect? It's called the Kennedy Forum. We have to give me a little, uh, give me a little room here. The good news is, is that when people are elected, you know, they can, if they have the political will, that is the difference, having the political will to implement this stuff. And they need no longer have to be looking for answers because Shirlene McRae is giving them the answers. Please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, David. Thank you for your courage, for sharing your stories, for your contributions to our nation, and of course, to mental health. We appreciate you so much. Oh my goodness. Uh, the political will, that is what it's all about, right? Um, this is a wonderful first time for me in Chicago, and I just want to thank Mayor Emanuel for his, um, his warm welcome to the Windy City. This is a moment I will cherish for for many years. I'm, I'm honored to accept the 2018 Leadership Award on behalf of my New York team and all those who have paved the way, people like David Satcher, who have made this moment possible. Thank you all for being here today. 
Now, I was just 13 years old when Dr. King asked, where do we go from here? And the speech we're drawing inspiration from this morning. And I want to set the scene a little bit for you. In 1967, following some major national victories, healthcare was one of the new frontiers in the, of the civil rights movement. Calling attention to the inferior medical care African Americans received, Dr. King said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhuman. And that was a time when antipsychotic medications like Thorazine were just gaining popularity, State-run institutions for those with mental illness were closing down, and very few people were insured for primary care or out-of-hospital care. And I was 13 years old in a world that seemed full of possibilities. I only had to look at my parents to believe that if you just work hard enough, the impossible was possible. My father was a World War II veteran, and my mother, the daughter of immigrants from the Caribbean, worked, worked really hard to provide us with a good education and opportunities that they had not had. And we were, we were privileged. We were a working class family living in a middle to upper class suburb in Western Massachusetts. But that meant that from kindergarten through high school, I was the only black student in every single one of my classes. And it meant that I was bullied and shamed and chased home by classmates. And even those who, who were kind could not shield me from the ostracism and the, uh, you know, the, the, the terrible things that, that young people and adults do to, to children of color. My difficulties in school were exacerbated by the fact that my amazing, hardworking parents were often withdrawn and did not communicate much with me and my siblings. And, too often, they didn't even communicate at all. I, you know, my father would go days sometimes without speaking to us. And looking back now, I can see the signs of depression so clearly. But of course, I didn't understand that as a child. I just felt like we've got this beautiful home and there's no joy. So I've seen through my life the stories of illness unspoken and the resulting confusion, uncertainty, and hurt how strikingly common they are and the anxiety that it can bring. Um, and I know that so many of us are, are, suffer. So many of us um, have this experience. And I, I want to ask you the question I ask in every room that I go to, and that is, how many of you, how many of you have suffered directly or indirectly from mental illness or substance misuse or both, either yourself or because of people that you care about? Please raise your hand. And look around, look around. I know we know this theoretically, but it's, I think it's always powerful to see like who we're sitting next to has been through experiences like this. And, and when you think about it, if one in five Americans struggles with a mental health condition in any given year, the other four are relatives, friends, co coworkers, and, and neighbors. And we, that means that no zip code, no income bracket, nor religion or ethnicity is untouched. And when mental illness and substance misuse goes untreated, we all suffer from this, the consequences. So these are not other people's problems. We're all in this together. And together is how we must move forward. But where do we go from here? As Dr. King posed this ever-relevant question and looked back at the previous decade, he took stock in the, in the movement's considerable successes. It is now another five decades. And and our, remar our progress is remarkable, but stark disparities remain in income, education, and of course, health care. The legacy of Jim Crow and slavery and all of our country's interlocking systems of oppression live on today. The challenge of mental illness and substance use are shared, but they are not shared equally. And I see living proof of, of that every day in our nation's largest city. In community conversations I've hosted across the five boroughs, people often share their stories of struggle seeking help. Um, for example, one woman who tried valiantly to find a black psychologist, um, a black psychologist that she could afford for her teenage daughter. And, and it's not a surprise she was not successful because only 5% of psychologists are African American. And I hear stories of cultural and language barriers every day. 
At our largest city jail in, at Rikers Island, I held a baby shower for a group of young mothers in prison for a low-level nonviolent offenses. And when I tried to play with these you know, little brown babies and toddlers, most of them would not engage or even speak. And it made me want to cry because they had already lost out on so much love and the critical brain development that comes from a healthy bond with their mothers. Research tells us that this loss causes children to struggle in school and run a higher risk of incarceration. Um, of course, this is a vicious cycle of our own making. The opioid crisis is receiving much more attention now because of the devastating effect opioids are having on rural white communities and the involvement of the pharmaceutical industry, but heroin has been around for a long time. Opioid use is increasing in communities of color, and I've spent so much time with folks in the Bronx and Staten Island who can map its damage across generations of their families. Our mental health services do not meet the needs of, of these people and so many others, which is why our movement for equity must be nimble, creative, and bold. And that's the idea behind Thrive NYC, our 54 initiative mental health plan. Using New York City as a laboratory for change, we're finding new solutions to address these injustices and inequities head on and to reform the systems that cause them. Thrive is narrowing massive treatment gaps by placing social workers, clinicians, and peer workers where they're needed most, like homeless shelters, family justice centers, primary care facilities, in underserved communities, and at the bedsides of recent overdose survivors. Thrive is partnering with trusted community organizations and training city workers and community leaders to help us reach the hardest to reach people. We're acting early, embedding social emotional learning into our, our pre-K, our free pre-K program in all curriculums and dedicating mental health support in all 1800 of our schools. And we're doing something that's even harder to measure too and that is changing the way people think about mental health. Now, we're doing that in many ways, but I have to tell you this one story. I met a wonderful psychiatrist a few months ago, a woman who decided to spend time away from her practice working in one of our family justice centers, which provide a myriad of services for domestic survivors. That was a big move for her, to go outside the confines of her office and meet with people in a location where she was needed. And she said to me, even with all of my years of education and all of my years working in the field, I never understood trauma until I felt it here in this room with me, silent but overpowering as I met with a woman and her daughter who had escaped violence. So even a trained expert can benefit from a change in perspective and a, a deeper understanding. I think that's a lesson for all of us. And that's why one of our 54 efforts to train a quarter of a million New Yorkers in mental health first aid to give them a deeper understanding of mental health challenges and to help how to help people in need is so needed. And that's why we've created a public engagement outreach team to get information out about our 24-hour multi-language helpline called NYC Well with trained counselors to help people make appointments with mental health professionals, um, appointments that they can afford. And, and get them all the services they need with mobile crisis units and, and um, everything that, that they need. We're, we're asking them, what do you need? And that's why we've tapped into the power of faith leaders as change agents. This May, New York City is hosting a third annual Weekend of Faith for Mental Health uh, and houses all of worship all over the country are encouraged to participate. Last year, we had 2,000 houses of worship in New York City and houses of worship in 40 cities participate. This year, we're going for more. And I hope some of you can help us make uh, an even greater impact by reaching even more people, help to help people, help us, all of us, to change the culture. And you don't have to be a faith leader to, to participate, to make change. You don't have to be a first lady, you don't have to be an Academy Award winner or a 23-time Olympic gold medalist to, to share your story and to give them courage to share their own story and give people help. As Dr. King reminded us, we're, we all have power. We have the ability to achieve purpose. 
Dr. King had not planned to be a radical thinker or a change maker, the change maker that he was in his life, let alone the revered national figure that we honor every year. But he felt a calling. He understood his power, and he did not shrink away from the power that he had. So I'm, I'm asking all of you today, do not shrink away from your power. We all have much more than we use. Harness it, combine it with others. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. You'll find that you can achieve much more than you ever dreamed. Your friends in New York City are here to help you. The Thrive Principles, which reflect the fact that no one size fits all, are yours to look at and to use. And we want to learn from all of you, too. And that's why we created Cities Thrive, a coalition of mayors and thought leaders to share best practices and advocate for a better funded, more integrated behavioral health system. And this coalition has grown quickly, quickly to represent nearly 200 cities in all 50 states, including Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. And you know, maybe we'll even get Chicago to join us. <laughs> Mayor Manuel may be able to help us with that. Cities Thrive is a powerful platform to share information with other reformers, and it's also a way to amplify our voices. Given the lack of leadership in the White House, that is more important than ever before. So I ask you for your help. There's so much work ahead of us, and I'd like to conclude with all of us making a pledge. Can you please all stand and repeat after me? I will share my mental health story. I will seize every opportunity to advocate for mental health equity. Yeah, you got to say this a little louder, OK? <laughs> I will start where I am, use what I have, and do what I can. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment to this movement. <laughs> you can sit down now. Dr. King, 50 years ago, called on us to go out with a divine dissatisfaction. So I say, let us all be dissatisfied until we correct for the failures of the path past until we catch people in need before they fall through the cracks. Let's get out there and promote wellness. Let's build a mental health care system, a health care system that serves everyone. Thank you. <laughs>